This week's episode is made possible by our friends at Independent Bank. You can learn more about them at i-bankonline.com. Good morning, Memphis. You're listening to Meanwhile in Memphis on WYXR Radio 91.7 FM. Meanwhile in Memphis is a program dedicated to conversations that celebrate the organizations, initiatives, and people that are shaping Memphis for the better. The Meanwhile in Memphis radio show and podcast are brought to you by New Memphis, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to develop, activate, and retain the city's most important resource, its people. Your hosts today are me, Rebecca Hamm, and my colleague, Anna Thompson. We're building a playlist of big ideas for Memphis and beyond at TEDx Memphis 2024. What will you add to the mix? If you've got a fresh new idea or want to remix a standard, apply for the opportunity to add your voice to TEDx Memphis, the mixtape by February 29th, 2024. Find out more about TEDx Memphis on the New Memphis website, newmemphis.org slash events, or at tedx memphis Com. Today, we're talking about the village needed to support individuals and families in Memphis. The adage is true. It takes everyone to create impacts from generation to generation. Joining us to talk about the impact of that village is the Reverend Dr. Kenneth Robinson, who serves as the president and CEO of the United Way of the Mid-South. Dr. Robinson earned his undergraduate and medical degrees from Harvard and his Master's of Divinity from Vanderbilt. After earning those degrees, he joined the Memphis community to serve in a multitude of roles. Kiki Hall is the newly appointed interim director at Catholic Charities of West Tennessee. She has been with Catholic Charities for three and a half years and just previously served as the senior director of community engagement. Kiki has enjoyed a distinguished career not only in corporate America, but also in marketing and nonprofit leadership. Previous to her leadership roles at Catholic Charities, she served as the CEO of Common Table Health Alliance and as the Chief Development and Communications Officer for Neighborhood Christian Centers, Inc. Are you ready to bring our guests into the studio? Let's do it. Good morning, Kiki and Ken. How are y'all this morning? Good. Great. How are you? Absolutely. So good. Good. Um, let's get started by having each of you share a little bit about yourselves. And if you're a native Memphian, or if not, what brings you to Memphis? So, Ken, we can start with you. Absolutely. I'm not a native Memphian. I was born and reared, as they say, in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, uh-huh. dun, absolutely. Dun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm trained as a physician and a minister. Uh, as a physician, I practiced internal medicine and uh, taught internal medicine, and then I was an assistant dean for admissions and student affairs here in Memphis at UT in the College of Medicine. Uh, I was also trained as a minister, and I pastored churches for 33 years, the last 25 of which are here uh, in Memphis. And uh, it was the church that brought me to Memphis uh, in 1991. I came to Pastor St. Andrew AME Church, and as you might guess from my sort of bi-professional background, uh, the intersection between faith and health and life uh, has been a very important one to me. And in South Memphis, I had the extraordinary experience of pastoring in a marvelous community, but a community both of promise but and potential, but a lot of problems. And so much of what you will hear today will be uh, sort of the, the syncretism of my uh, long and varied <laughs> professional career working with uh, body, soul, and spirit and helping to improve the quality of life of the people that I served, either as a physician or as a pastor. I'm married, and I have uh, two great daughters who are both physicians, and uh and uh, my wife is a marvelously retired uh, former hospital administrator. I love it. And she is awesome. I love your wife. <laughs> Thank you. She's such so a great lady. I. <laughs> I, I know you do. I know. She's very lovable. <laughs> so what about you, Kiki? So I am not a Memphian either, although oh. I have been here uh, a little over 30 years now. Both chosen Memphians then? Yes. Yes. yes sort of for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was actually raised, my dad was in the army when I was, um, had just gotten out of the army when I was born. Uh, so I was born in actually Berlin, Germany. And then he got a job with American Express Bank over in Germany. We moved a couple of places there. And then in the United States, we moved all over. Every time he got a promotion, we had to move. So we landed in Atlanta 
uh, when I was about 12 years old, and they loved the lifestyle in the South so much, they said, hey, we're going to stay here. And uh, so he commuted back and forth, New York and all over the world, really, for many years with American Express. But we stayed in Atlanta. My whole family still lives there. But my first job out of college put me um, in first Mobile, Alabama, and then I got transferred here to Memphis, met my husband, and he wasn't going anywhere because he was from here and he had a family business here. So um, God, I guess, said, you're going to stay in Memphis. So uh, anyway, so I've been here now for, like I said, 30 years, and we have three kids, um, 23, 22, almost 22, and 19, uh, two girls and a boy. And um, they're all, one's graduated college, the other two have, um, are in college now, one's about, to, another one's about to graduate. So anyway, we've been staying busy with, with rearing kids for sure. And, um, but the, I love Memphis, you know, the people here to me are just the, the treasure of this city. So um, anyway, I'm, I am happy being a Memphian. I love to hear it. I love it. Uh, and it's wonderful to hear that you both care about the community that you have, have come to, to choose. Absolutely. Um, and you both serve the community. Um, yes. Ken, could you talk to us a little about a bit about your work with United Way? Absolutely. Uh, United Way of the Mid-South uh, is an institution, an organization that just celebrated our 100th anniversary uh, in this community. Uh, traditionally, the United Way has been a source of public grant making. We are a public charitable foundation. Uh, historically, we've asked members of the community and our corporate partners uh, to uh, donate to United Way, and we've had an extraordinary small army of volunteers who've always been able to look throughout the nonprofit community, determine who would be the best uh, and uh, the most uh, critical agencies to support. And we've made millions of dollars of grants, uh, now over $85 million over the history of this United Way uh, to high-performing nonprofits. Uh, but we are a different United Way today uh, because we've recognized that simply funding individual high-performing agencies, uh, while extraordinarily impactful for those agencies and for the clients, their participants, those that they serve, uh, it is not really moving the needle uh, in Memphis and the Mid-South. Uh, we serve uh, eight counties in this area, and yet we still know that the pervasive underlying problem that impacts so many of our domains uh, is multi-generational, uh, persistent, intransigent poverty. Uh, and United Way, with its extraordinary relationship over the years with the human service community, uh, thought that uh, we could do something a little bit more impactful uh, by uh, bringing together agencies uh, in a collective impact model uh, to take that relationship that we've had as a funder of nonprofits and to say, can we not work together? And we've discovered that people that are living in poverty, uh, certainly multi-generational poverty, uh, simply while, while being served extraordinarily well by a single agency that does uh, perhaps provide a single service or an array of several services, that family cannot move, here it is today, from where they are to where they dream to be by only being served by individual agencies. And unfortunately, it is the world of nonprofits that we uh, do tend to focus on what we do and what we do well. Uh, we have boards, we have fundraisers, and we are by definition, and I can say this honestly as one who's been in the nonprofit world as an executive for decades as well, by definition, we are focused on the uh, existential um, uh, development of our nonprofit. And we have tended to work in silos. And that just doesn't work well for families that have a multitude of needs uh, across multiple domains. And the United Way decided that for the first time, we would try to pull together a network of agencies, agencies that previously had worked in silos, but who are now working in a United Way. And that's, I think, what we'll talk about today, uh, this entity called Driving the Dream. Uh, we, as a United Way, understand that people have dreams. We all do. People who've been living in poverty have dreams. 
They all do, but they also have uh, an array of challenges and hurdles and closed doors and uh, that have kept them from advancing socioeconomically. So at United Way, we've decided we're going to be about driving their dreams and just delighted to talk about that today. I'm so excited to, to dig in and to learn more. Um, but before we get too far, I'd love to get a better understanding of, in our community, how is poverty defined and what are some of the contributing factors to multi-generational poverty? And I think uh, at the core and the root of your question is exactly uh, the answer that Driving the Dream addresses. Uh, the uh, root causes of poverty can be multitudinous. Uh, these are uh, families that, again, uh, without uh, uh, labeling them and without thinking poorly of them, which unfortunately is the case uh, throughout our community by many people, families that are living in communities, communities that have been disinvested, communities that have had um, uh, a, a lack of investment in their public education, communities that represent very, very poor health outcomes, communities in which uh, uh, individuals are not as employed uh, as in other communities, uh, communities in which uh, there has been a concentration of poverty and uh, the lack of opportunity for children that are uh, being reared in those communities to see others that are succeeding and others that have lifestyles to which they can aspire. Uh, communities in which there has not been high quality child care communities. So so it is the array of challenges, communities that have not uh, been uh, the target of traditional financial institutions that have been preyed on communities in which there have been high concentration of alcohol uh, uh, dispensing institutions uh, and al alcoholic beverage uh, selling institutions and uh, communities in which there has not been full service grocery stores. And so uh, the, the, the conflation of all of that uh, for families that have only lived in those communities uh, that have been uh, targeted uh, for what they do not have and have been targeted by the representation of the poor outcomes that they do demonstrate, those communities are uh, are contributing to what we now see as multi-generational poverty. And, and it is very much the case that we are trying to address all of those issues for all of those families to help them move serially and sequentially out of poverty. And I think that's what's so hard about multi-generational poverty is that these families, uh, many of them, their, their grandparents, their parents were all raised in that same community in that, in that same inner, uh, multi-generational poverty, a lot of these children who are now adults or are now even grandparents don't know any different. And so um, that's another wonderful thing about driving the dream is trying to help these folks see that there are other pathways and there is um, another path that you can take that looks different. They don't, a lot of them don't even know what that can look like. And so um, that's another thing, beautiful thing about this program, too, is that we're able to share uh, what, what other paths can look like for a lot of these families. And that helps them have hope. And that's another thing, too, that a lot of these communities have, uh, are lacking is some hope. Because, again, they don't know any, any different, a lot of them. Um, and they've just been raised, you know, one generation after the other. And um, so giving them that hope. Um, and and giving them that permission to dream and think outside outside of their neighborhood is a beautiful thing. Well said. And so, with driving the dream, you know, how are you approaching the the sharing of these opportunities and and giving people the autonomy to make choices to to take a different path? Well, one of the things we recognize and we acknowledge is that uh, parents of children, families uh, do have aspirations. They do have a desire uh, to do better, to do more, to move forward. What they often do not have is access uh, mm -hmm. to services. And so in concept, uh, back in 2015, 2016, Driving the Dream uh, intended to provide equitable access 
to the kinds of services, to the kinds of exposures, to the kinds of input that can change the trajectory of a family. If you do not know that services exist, one cannot access them. If you cannot uh, have equitable access to them, you cannot benefit from them. And so Driving the Dream, by definition, uh, says that we have extraordinary nonprofits, at least the second time I've said that, but working in somewhat isolation. And if in Memphis we have nearly 5,000 uh, nonprofits, many of them faith-based nonprofits, doing extraordinary work. Uh, the challenge is, and the solution that we've created for that challenge, is making certain that people know how to access them. Uh, for instance, uh, over the course of this uh, podcast, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, the phone number that we've given the public that people can know. But But the critical issue is that people tend to find their way through the doors of an agency that can meet a need at a given time. And so what that agency can provide that individual or family is extraordinary. But now we've created the opportunity for that agency to share the models, to share the tool, to share even a, an informational data platform and to share the client so that once that agency has been accessed by hook or crook, however someone has, I often say, stumbled in, dealing with the uh, fierce urgency of now, they've gotten to that age, that person at that agency, that frontline person, uh, the person serving that individual or family, now has access and will know about other agencies in other domains providing other services that while that individual or family is sitting there, uh, that person can be connected to other agencies. The one question that people told us early on that they are never asked is, what else do you need? We can solve this issue. We can address this problem. But we have now trained a network, a panoply of agencies across 20 different domains to ask the next question. We can solve this, but what else are you needing? What else is keeping you from moving forward? What other concerns do you have? And those sorts of referrals now can be made within this functional collaborative network called Driving the Dream. So the, so the way that's working is uh, United Way has chosen... Is it nine agencies with 12 hub locations? Yes. Um, nine agents. They've chosen nine agencies to be what we call a hub uh, location of driving the dream. Some of them have multiple sites, and that's why there's 12 in total. Catholic Charities was is blessed to be one of those hubs. And basically, we will have a care coordinator at our location um, that will not only um, serve those that are coming in in crisis that perhaps would... Uh, um, be um, a candidate for driving the dream program it has it's a two generation it's 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 a um, adult and ch ch child there has to be at least one adult one a child in the in the family to be part of the driving the dream program so our care coordinator does all the assessments i mean united way has laid it all out there's all kinds of assessments and tools that are used in this process and um, so they do the assessment and that's where all these other needs can come out. Not only are you in crisis right now because you don't have anything left in your food pantry, in, in your cupboard to cook for dinner that night for yourself and your child. Your child also needs diapers, you know, whatever that might be, this crisis situation. Um, we move them beyond that. We look at the, the full assessment. We see what all their challenges are and how not only our agency can help them, but then we go through all the referral agencies, the other agencies that United Way has in um, in their uh, portfolio, basically, and we help each other. We use one database. So when we mm -hmm. send a referral to, um, say, um, MIFA, say we need to send a referral to MIFA for some reason, um, they will then see in their system, oh, Catholic Charities has sent over one of their Driving the Dream um, folks to us in order to help them with X, Y, Z. So that's the great thing too. Yeah. Again, breaking down those silos that a lot of the, the nonprofits in town have had over the mm -hmm. years. And now we're all working together 
for this one sweet little family to try and move them from crisis to self-sufficiency? There, there actually are over 130 agencies in the entire Driving the Dream Network. And again, some of those are the single door into which a family or individual might come. And those 130 agencies, uh, as an aggregate, uh, provide over 275 different programs. So it's a marvelous network. Uh, There have been over 14,000 referrals in that network from agency to agency. And sometimes we make those referrals if the individual, the family, the client is willing to that care coordination hub, such as Catholic Charities of West Tennessee. And then that hub can do the intensive case management. 14,000 interactions and referrals in the network, uh, 9,000 unique families, uh, adult with child, Uh, have been served in these years. And then uh, in April of 2020, at the height of the pandemic, we opened a call center because there were many, many families that had not experienced um, intractable multi-generational poverty who were pushed over the edge. You might imagine, and it is true, that we have had over 14,000 calls into the Driving the Dream hotline, at which point, at that access point, uh, people are are referred to uh, the agency that can service the need that they have for that day. And then they get the magical uh, intake question and driving the dream. Are there other things with which we can help you? It's a fabulous, we are, we're not hoping people's dreams come true. We're facilitating those dreams. We are making it possible for them to have those dreams fulfilled. We're driving their dreams. This is, feels so innovative. Mm-hmm. Is this a model that is unique, not only within our community, but with within other cities? Are there other cities that have programs like this, or has Memphis kind of led the way? Well, we, we lead what, the way in poverty, do, do we not? Yes, yeah, in many instances, and all of our listeners today understand the impact of poverty, mm-hmm. uh, whether they are in uh, traditional business or banking or education or health care. And so because we are uh, such a leader in that unfortunate uh, element, uh, we are uh, providing something which is fairly uh, innovative. And we are helping other communities to adopt such a collective impact model. Collective impact in and of itself is not uh, new or unique. However, working in this manner to this degree, uh, to this extent, for individuals and families is very innovative. Uh, We are sharing it with other United Ways who tend to have uh, uh, multi-domain relationships with multiple nonprofits as a grantor. Uh, But the concept is is one thing. Implementing it has been another. I was about to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's a lot of coordination. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) We we are very much grateful for all of the willingness of the agencies because people that are doing this work really do recognize uh, that we're in it to help people do better, uh, help their lives improve. And so there's not uh, any hesitation about the willingness to share But the practicality of this has been something which the United Way of the Mid-South has brought. And it is it it is extraordinarily uh, complicated. We actually sign memoranda of understanding now because of funding sources. We sign uh, contracts with our referral network partners, those over 130 that I mentioned. Uh, We have uh, funding relationships now. We are being able, because of funding from the Tennessee Department of Human Services, to actually provide payment for success so that if families and individuals are advancing and can document that they are advancing, again, from where they were towards where they're dreaming to be, we are are compensating those nonprofit agencies uh, for being a part of that socioeconomic advancement. Uh, The shared database is a very complex one, but isn't it a great idea that families don't have to tell their story over and over again (laughs) and present their eligibility over and over again? Uh, So it it is uh, complex, but it is one that is worthy 
of the investment of time and effort uh, for this United Way. And thankfully, the state has recognized that. And that's when um, the United Way got this recent amazing, what, $18 million, $18 million grant dollars. from so, the state, which then they have been able to then parlay that out to all of us as hubs and referral partners uh, so that we can do even more um, directly with these clients and these families. I feel like y'all have already talked so much about so many things, but I'm so <laughs> excited to dig deeper. Um, so a few of the questions I have. So something you mentioned, Ken, is that, you know, the database is complex, which I would imagine it has to be. Um, but then so many other factors are also complex when it comes to those experiencing poverty. Um, and we've talked to others in the community like Habitat for Humanity, and they use, you know, social determinants of health. And yes. as we've mentioned before, none of, none of this is in a silo. For someone to experience success or their dream, it has to be wraparound services. It's not just one thing in a silo that would fix something. Poverty in and it itself is complex, so right. the solution would need to be equally complex. And, and isn't that a wonderful word, wraparound? It mm -hmm. gives your listener a sense of the fact that it like really is yes. about the whole person, and it is a, a holistic approach to the individual and the family. Um, but I'm curious, too, about how partners and hubs were selected or how this relationship formed. Kiki, can you tell us more about what the Catholic Charities of West Memphis does and how Driving the Dream was appealing to an organization like yours? So Catholic Charities of West Tennessee has been around now for over 50 years. Uh, we've been serving clients right there at Jefferson and Cleveland and Midtown for that, that entire time. Um, we ha handle basically a lot of the basic needs. We um, we feed people. We're, we're actually chartered to serve all 21 counties of West Tennessee. So United wow. Way, the Mid-South is eight of those counties. And then United Way of um, West Tennessee is the remaining counties. Um, so we actually work with both agencies, which is wonderful. Um, so we we feed people, a lot of people. We have, um, what are we up to like 10 different service locations now, six of which do mobile pantries and different here in Shelby County and outside of Shelby County. Um, we clothe people. We have a very large clothing closet. Uh, folks come in all the time, uh, have appointments, and they can get up to five outfits for themselves and their children. Um, we also do um, housing. We have one of the largest housing agencies in town. We are one of the only agencies that can now, um, be, because of the, the great work that our housing department has done, we now have uh, contracts for all populations. So we're able to serve all populations in our housing uh, department. And then we um, we also have our homeless services, outreach services. Every morning we'll see anywhere from two to 300 um, homeless and low, very low income folks come to our front porch. They can get a daily meal bag. They can get a cup of coffee. Um, they can have a little respite time for themselves. And on Wednesdays, they can also get clothing. And then we also offer hygiene kits to them uh, daily as well. So that happens every morning on our front porch. Our our um, parking lot, we have a mobile pantry every Monday through Thursday for families that are needing help, that are having a hard time making ends meet. Um, they, we provide a box of food that can last a, a family of four up three to five days. Um, and then in addition to those basic needs that we meet, we also have some special community programs, um, Tiny Blessings being one of them, where we're helping um, n new moms and infants caregivers we say caregivers because sometimes it's grandparents that are raising the babies and, and sometimes it's just dads that are raising the babies so um, those baby essentials can be expensive especially to folks that are on a fixed income and um, so we're trying to kind of help support those um, newborns and those families of newborns uh, with some of those basic essentials that can be very costly um, and we also just recently had our um, gifts for god's children program which is our christmas program and we were able to give over 600 children um, in Memphis a wonderful Christmas morning um, with, through a family-to-family -family adoption. We have churches, we have corporations, we have individual families that uh, are adopt other families. And we also then get folks to apply to be the adopt, adopted families. And we pair them together, and it's a beautiful thing. So um, anyway, so we kind of do a lot of those basic things. And... Um, and I don't know, know. You'll have to ask United I, Way I why they chose us, I, I, but we're we're very blessed that they did. I, I was going to say, I think she, we do a really she, good job. She, she has answered the question for you about <laughs> yeah, why, why Catholic why charities <laughs> would be of interest to driving the dream, yeah. because what are the chances that someone who needs emergency housing 
only needs emergency housing. Exactly. Correct. What yeah. are the chances that someone who needs a food box in Catholic Charities has that as that individual or family's only need? So clearly, a Catholic Charities, like our other hub agencies, would be an extraordinary access point to driving the dream, right. from which then those individuals can be um, referred to all the other sorts of services. And that is the key to driving the dream. It is a one door approach, certainly a no wrong door approach. But if you walk into any of the single doors of the extraordinary agencies like Catholic Charities, then immediately the thought process begins that uh, this person, this parent and child in a family centered model must have other needs, and we have the capacity, even though we don't do it at our agency, to connect them. That individual looking for emergency housing may have need for some health care, behavioral health care, certainly uh, workforce development, job training, uh, may have other uh, persons in the family that will need either adult education or the children will need high-quality child care or perhaps they're displaced and they'll need to be connected to other uh, public uh, education. Uh, there are concerns uh, throughout their lives about uh, all of the basic needs, but all the ancillary needs that also uh, come together to help a family be self-sufficient Absolutely. and to move out of crisis. Yeah. So uh, we are looking for agencies that not only uh, serve as a marvelous portal, but also for our hub agencies, for those intensive case management care coordination agents have the capacity and the understanding and the background uh, to then make multiple referrals and really manage the individuals that come to their doors. For most of our agencies, we just say make the referral. And because of the community of practice that the United Way has built uh, through Driving the Dream, they now don't only have to depend on, well, I know Bob over at a certain agency. I now have access to this extraordinary network, this functional collaborative network, this accountable human services network, so that I know that any of the individuals, any of the agencies in this community of practice called Driving the Dream, where we've received the training, we're continuing uh, to get the quality improvement uh, training from the United Way staff. I can make a referral to X agency. I've never seen them. I don't know them, but I do know that they are providing quality care at a standard that I can feel comfortable making the referral through our shared database uh, to another agency. Well, and because United Way has been around for so long, they also obviously know the agencies they that they can rely on, right? And that they know that the uh, the clients will be will, will be able to rely on as well. So. Um, you know, it's 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 just a great partnership. May, may I just pause board. to say why this makes so much sense to your listeners? Uh, you've got uh, uh, people, uh, my peers in New Memphis Institute, that have come through uh, the, your programs who have HR departments. But this is not what a company does. But the companies will have employees who have challenges, and one of the ways of reducing the revolving door for employment at companies is to have your word, Anna, wraparound services available for those employees and and just make the referral to driving the dream. Uh, 50 years ago, when I went into medical school, we taught uh, and I was taught um, medical students to understand the social history. Health outcomes for individuals and families are inextricably related to the living situations, those social determinants of health, Mm -hmm. the things that impact their long-term health outcomes. If you have no heat in the winter, uh, that's going to help, uh, you know, sort of uh, make your problem, your upper respiratory tract infection a little worse. Uh, If you are living in a, an overcrowded uh, housing situation, then you're going to have transmittable diseases be transmitted more. Uh, And so, Those social determinants, we understand it in the banking industry. Uh, The reason many of our financial institutions are struggling to meet their CRA requirements is that just teaching financial education and empowerment is not enough uh, if persons are living in multi-generational poverty. The other wraparound issues are 
needed to be addressed. Children do better academically when their families are doing better. So their long-term educational outcome. It is not a new concept, but it is the success that partners like Catholic Charities and our other 130 partners and these major hubs have invested in the United Way, and we in turn are investing in them to invest in the lives of the families, the the adults and the children who are moving from where they are to where they dream to be. For anyone who is in need of that investment, in need of your services, how can they get connected to you? Uh, The marvelous toll-free phone number, which even I can remember, uh, (laughs) is a one-stop portal to driving the dream, 844 444-4211, 444-4211, we have counselors, there are real people on the back end of that phone number, uh, and uh, we, in our network, actually require and monitor and assess whether we are responding in a timely way uh, to the request and the needs of those callers within 24, 48 hours, United Way is assuring that someone is getting that need met. And of course, people can always look on our website, UW MidSouth, no punctuation, UW as in United Way, uwmidsouth.org. And and you will see uh, links to Driving the Dream. Great. And Kiki, I'll ask the same thing for Catholic Charities. I know you all work in tandem, but you also do some uh, individualized work. So how can folks uh, access your services? Yes, you can uh, give us a call at 901-722-4700. 901-722-4700. Our website is ccwtn, catholiccharitieswesttennessee.org. And we're also there open daily at 1325 Jefferson. Um, and then our homeless outreach center is right there next, it's, it's the building right next door to our main campus. So, um, again, Monday through Friday, if you, um, have a, a place, a home, a kitchen where you can cook things, please come to our mobile pantry if you're in need of food for your family. Um, and then if you are homeless and you are in need of food, uh, or a cup of coffee, like I said, you can visit our outreach center Monday through Friday, starting at 8 a.m., And on the flip side of that, for anyone who is able to make investments in the work that you're doing and support it through their time, talent, treasures, or ties, yes, um, how can they get connected? (laughs) Same way. (laughs) What opportunities are out there? Absolutely. Thank you. We we can always use donations, can't we? We absolutely can. (laughs) And it is our only source of grant making to these extraordinary high-performing agencies. UW Mid-South. Dot org. Mm-hmm. Uh, there will be a giving portal there. <laughs> and then there's you. a donate tab at ccwtn.org. The other thing, too, is folks that are looking for work. Uh, I forgot to mention earlier, we started a social enterprise this past year called Endeavor Staffing, E-N-D-A-V-O-R, Endeavor Staffing. And we are getting people wonderful living wage jobs that are um, permanent to temporary, I mean, temporary to permanent. We recently had um, a couple of folks that got um, permanently placed with a company and they are thrilled and so we are it's uh, we like i said we're just starting out but um that has been a whole lot of fun watching a lot of these people get self-sufficient yeah yeah (laughs) what has been the response to the referrals from those who come to catholic charities like whenever you are able to give them referrals and ask that critical question, Ken, that what else do you need question? What has the response been? Well, you should see the the light uh, that comes up in their eyes. So what do, you mean? what do you mean? There's other things that I can get help with. You know, I have I'm challenged with um, child care for my child. I want to get a job, but I don't have anywhere to um, take my children for good quality child care. Oh, well, we've got a referral for that. You know, um, I, th- I think I think they're amazed that I think that's the, the thing that another wonderful thing that Driving the Dream is doing, and that is it's opening more doors for the clients that are coming and they're seeing that there is a lot of resources out there that they probably didn't know how to tap into. Um, But that's the reason why these hubs are so important because they know what all those resources are. And when, as you go through and you get to know this client, you do all the assessments and you realize, huh, You've got so many challenges, so many things that are preventing you from kind of taking that next step to self-sufficiency, and and we can help you with those. And at the end of the day, uh, we have a 
Likert scale, there is a tool uh, that in this family-centered, client-centered model, uh, the individuals who are served uh, uh, both at intake indicate where they are. They may be in crisis, a one. Obviously, they're not appearing empowered, which would be a five, but there is a Likert scale between one and five, and our agencies like Catholic Charities do note where they are at the point of intake into driving the dream. And the United Way, through that shared data platform, is able to assess with ongoing qualitative interviews yep. that we've trained our agencies to, to conduct where those individuals are by their own admission. They've moved one step forward. They've moved uh, two steps forward. And the marvelous outcome, the assessment, the evaluation that makes driving the dream so attractive is that for individuals who undergo uh, intensive care coordination case management, University of Memphis has shown that uh, they are moving on the average of 2.3 points forward towards self-sufficiency and empowerment. Yep. That's very impressive to any of your listeners. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a basic fundamental outcome for us to be able to say, in reality, by their own assessments and their own assertion, individuals are, again, you, you're getting the sense this is our tagline, moving from where they yes. are to, <laughs> to where, where they, they dream, dream to be. be. But that uh, socioeconomic mobility, that advancement is meaningful to me uh, as a clinician, as a pastor, as an executive, and it is extraordinarily helpful for our agency partners. They may not provide all those services for both adults and children, but what an extraordinary narrative it is for them to be able to say, for Kiki to say that for someone who came in, we've made a referral, they are literally, by their own uh, admission, moving, advancing, going forward, overcoming barriers in one of multiple domains in their lives. In, in, our, in our contract with United Way uh, in executing this program, it is very specific in there. These, these pr very specific performance measures um, of outcomes that we have to show um, as part of the ongoing assessment and case management that we do with these clients. So we are under contract to make sure that we are doing the right things to get these folks to move those you know, two Hopefully, even three would be amazing points on that self-sufficiency continuum. And they continuum. would be doing, they're doing it anyway. Yeah, yeah. But it does allow us as an institution to be able to document mm -hmm. that to our funders. We've had over uh, 23 funding sources that have come from uh, the public sector, from the private sector, from the educational sector, uh, from private philanthropy, because we are seeking, we are searching, we are hungry for solutions that have measurable outcomes for these individuals. And well, and that's families. the reason why I love this model um, th and having those specific measured outcomes because there are a lot of agencies doing great things. And I'm not going to take anything away from them. But again, actually being able to see that we're moving somebody in the right direction. Um, we're not just continuing to th throw everything at them, uh, but the kitchen sink <laughs> to try to help Make it them. Sticks. Okay, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you. But what did that do for you? Where 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 are you going next? Are you are you going along that self sufficiency continuum like everybody in our community wants people to do? So our, our corporate partners would say it like this, like the old folks used to say. You know, you're tired of throwing good money after bad. You know, <laughs> right, and right. Um, and and there is a donor fatigue. Absolutely. When there is no evidence that uh, there is a, an impact that is literally transforming lives. Giving can be transactional. Giving uh, to agencies like our partners and to the United Way can be literally transformational in the lives of these individuals that we serve. And that's what we're and that's what we're hoping. That's what the goal is. That's what I was about to ask. So you've already answered a few of my questions that I had listed here. So um, about how the impact would be measured and how the data would be utilized. I mean, we as a nonprofit totally understand. You know, you need that data to Absolutely. get that funding. And so I'm just. If you look at the contract, Floored. you see all the different yeah. tools and assessment tools and um, measurable outcomes that we have to that that we are going to be utilizing to help these folks 
get to where they need to be. I mean, just the database alone. I'm like so curious. I want to like. I'm like. I want a, a, a peek at this. This looks amazing. And like, I would like nerd out over what this database must just be it, like. It is literally amazing. I honestly. mean, so I want to like hats off to that. Um, because at any point of what y'all have been talking about in this continuum, like whether it's the training or the shared database or the access points, the myriad of access points for the individuals and families that need these services. If any link in that chain is broken, then the whole system doesn't Correct. work. And so that connectivity, that shared partnership and collaboration is really, I feel like the glue that's making driving the dream work. Absolutely. And, and as you mentioned, and if I could take, this opportunity to say the connectivity is literally what the United Way is all about. And uh, in a way that I think that we are doing something which has not been done before, certainly through the 1100 United Ways, but it is a model. uh, It is a framework uh, that is uh, eminently replicable in other places and other communities. And we look forward to sharing it. We're getting it. We're getting it right uh, here in Memphis in a place of high need and high poverty. And uh, you might imagine then we're having the opportunity to uh, to help disseminate the concept and then have communities uh, format their own structures that generate these kinds of outcomes. It's just important when you have a community like ours that is has the statistics, the poverty statistics mm-hmm. that we do, it's going to take the whole community. You know, mm-hmm. it's going to take um, all of these agencies working together um, and and for our community to understand that we as agencies are wanting to um, be united and all work together in order to move this com- community, you know, because we've got a lot, we, we, we've got a big hill to climb, but we can do it as long as we're all, all doing it together. We all have the same goal in mind and as to get this community healthier uh, and more um, self-sufficient and economically um, healthy. I feel so. like you just answered my next question. Oh, Kiki, sorry. no, that's great. Sorry. Is um, <laughs> No, don't apologize. Is what does success look like, both for Catholic Charities of yep. West Tennessee, but also for driving the dream it, as a whole? What it, does it look like? It means more families living a more healthy and economically stable life, right? Um, if 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 poverty affects the entire community, not just those that are living in poverty um, for so many reasons. And so it's just if we can get more folks um, moving on that self-sufficiency continuum, uh, get more folks out there um, having the dreams, having the hope and um, becoming self-sufficient and economically stable, then the entire community is healthier and we're all better off for it. So it's, it's just, it's just making this community stronger, better. Um, but there's a lot of great people in this community that want to see uh this program work, but also see our community turn the corner and be uh, a healthier place to live. And um, I think this is the, that this could help do that a whole, a whole I, lot. I wish I could say that we will see the needle move on multi-generational poverty. I will not promise that as a single agency and entity. Our brand promise is that every individual and every family that comes through the portal of driving the dream can and will advance. I leave it to our colleagues in the universities, in the, in in the academy Mm -hmm. to determine if after doing this for 20,000 families and 40,000 families, that would be enough to actually move the needle on poverty. I would believe so as a man of faith, I would say so Mm -hmm. Uh, that however is in another domain of those who understand the nuances of statistics up and down. But I can say success looks like exposing as many individuals and as many families to the capacity, this equitable access, the opportunity to have the services that they need that will allow them to advance socioeconomically. That's what I can assess. That's what I can measure. That's what I can report. And that is what's generating the support from those who are uh, encouraging us to grow, driving the dream. That's success for every individual. And that is success for those families. And that's a good point because, you know, you can't force um, families, individuals to say, hey, well, if you do this, 
you know, or if you follow up on that referral and you go and, and you do all of the things that this agency is telling you to is suggesting that you do. We can't we can't force that. That's this a really is good family point. centered, client centered. Yes. And it's totally driven by, again, the the hopes and aspirations of, of those of individuals. Yes. Given the opportunity. Yes. And yep. breaking down those barriers too. I mean, just from right. previous conversations we've even had on this podcast, is that the the mountain you spoke of earlier, Kiki, it feels so insurmountable to individuals and families who are living in poverty. Right. And who are experiencing poverty. And it feels like, well, if I have to go to 50 different places and, and stand share my story yes. and yes. beg for resources right. at all of the, you know, plead my case at right. all of these different things, that's just too much. It it's just, right. I don't have the time. Yep. I don't have the transportation. I don't have right. that availability to access all of the resources that Memphis has for me. And so... Being able to share that in that database, I know I'm like, you know, I don't know how many times I can say I love your database and I, I haven't even it. seen it, but like that, I feel like has to break down some of those hurdles for the individual. And, and, and what individuals tell us, and you can imagine, is that the system that they know always has worked against them. Yes, yeah. yeah. We've built a system that works for, for them. them. Mm-hmm. And that is their own testimony that, wow, this is the first time in our lives uh, that someone has intentionally, not only in one agency, because extraordinary work, I, one of my favorite words, because we are lifting up all of our nonprofit partners, but it is the first time that agencies have worked together and that there is a system working on my behalf. And for me, for a preacher, as we'll say, that'll preach. <laughs> I mean, that, amen. That, amen. <laughs> this is why I love um, being around him. <laughs> he's, he's so positive. Um, he has so much energy. And, um, you know, this is his, um, this is his, his brainchild right here. The driving the dream. It's part of my calling. It, it, and, it is. And, and it, so it's, it's the mission of United Way like, also. We're, we're improving the quality of life of mid Southerners. Yeah. That's right? what we're trying to do. By yep. mobilizing and aligning resources to address priority issues. And oh my gosh, if this isn't a priority issue, this is not a barn burning issue. This is not a community uh, transformational issue mm-hmm. in terms of helping people move out of poverty. What is? I'm curious for both of you, what's on the horizon that's bringing you hope for this year in your work? Wow. So much. You know, for me, I like to just go just every day when I go outside of our building and I see what's happening out there and I talk with our staff and I talk with our clients and I see the smiling faces of the folks that are getting served and the, the sweet and kind eyes of those that say, thank you so much for this. I, I really wasn't sure where I was going to get my next meal today. Um, that always gives me hope because I see the glimmer of hope in their eyes that we've been able to provide to them. Um, but also, uh, I think this program um, is one. We have a lot of case managers at Catholic Charities because of our housing uh, program and all of our housing grants. Um, but to add this to sort of our arsenal so that we can serve um, adults and children, you know, families and all of their wraparound services and showing them that, that pathway and showing them all of the different resources that, that could, that that they could utilize in order to become more stable and more self-sufficient is just to me um, that gives me hope. And again, we can't, we can't necessarily say we're going to affect this this entire community, you know, overnight. But one person, one family at a time, we can make a difference in their lives. Like I said, these two folks that just got permanently placed, um, they're thrilled. They they right. now have you know a regular paycheck coming in every yeah. week, and and they're they're like, this is the greatest thing ever. You know, I know how much money I'm going to make. I know what I how much money you know how I'm going to pay my bills. How I'm going to buy food for my family. Like, um, just small changes like that but if we can see that you know through all the families that we serve oh man what a glimmer of hope that is and if we can pull out uh, what gives me great hope is that we've been successful 
in changing the culture of how nonprofits work together. Uh, we have been successful in a type of sector integration. So this accountable care system and network that we are all working at appropriate places, providing the services that we can, but we are integrating this human services sector. And what gives me hope is that we are finding entities that will fund us to do this work. That is very, very, very critical because it must be sustainable for us to then have the long-term impact in Memphis and the Mid-South. And that doesn't come without significant funding. And the final component of that is that there must be public investment and public funding. Because at the end of the day, a private philanthropy, corporate philanthropy, individual philanthropy, personal philanthropy, very critical, very needed, not sustainable for long-term social impact change. And so I'm delighted uh, that we've been able to usher in and to work with our partners to create that kind of sustainable funding or the rationale for it that I think we are exercising now uh, at United Way for driving the dream. Well, that gives me hope. <laughs> Doesn't get better than that. Thank you so much. What a great way to start off the year. It just feels really energized and excited about the opportunities that are available and streamlined and aligned to your point earlier. Well, it's so fun and appropriate that we're talking about this the day after you know, uh, MLK Day. Absolutely. Right? Um, so he had a dream. Dr. Robinson, United Way has a dream. And all of us agencies are dreaming right along with them um, to hope fulfill a lot of individuals and families dreams. So, yeah, it's good stuff. Knowing that we've got a community that is working hand in hand and working to solve complex problems collaboratively, that that gives me so much hope going into not just today, but every day. Uh, and it makes our work worth doing. One thing across the board, because I'm out and so is uh, Dr. Robinson out talking a lot to com other community uh, partners and other agencies. The beautiful thing about, and I think everybody in Memphis should know this, is that 99% of the, the nonprofits and the folks working at nonprofits, their hearts are in such the right place. They all, um, I brag all the time about the servant hearts of the folks that work, certainly at our agency, but as you get to know other agencies and the folks are working there. Um, I mean, obviously, most people working in nonprofits are not doing it to become millionaires. That's not going <laughs> to happen, right? And um, they really are. It's amazing the hearts and and um, the servant attitude that all of them, everyone has to just try to help individuals, but also help our community be a better place. It's just it's beautiful. And so um, just know for you, for you all and for your listeners too, that um, we are all, all of the folks that are working in these nonprofit agencies, their hearts are in the right place and we're all doing the, the work of, for this community to try to, to help everybody, you know, just be, be better, get to a better place. And hope, hopefully at the end of the day and years to come, we'll be able to look back and say, look where we've, where we've come from there to now. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing good things. We're doing good things. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Independent Bank is celebrating 25 years of sharing your stories, building your dreams, and serving you heroically. Find out how iBank can help you achieve your financial dreams at i-bankonline.com. Member FDIC.